going by the rooms of the Russian side and so on. So it's going to be a system of speaker slips inside the hall. So the stewards walking up and down with the slips, if people want to take the slips, fill them in, hand them back into the stewards if you want to speak. The people on the balcony, we'll be a steward up there with speaker slips, but when you fill them in, if you want to put them in, you'll have to bring them downstairs, but stewards aren't running them downstairs all the time, and then wait to see if you call to speak. So we can keep the uh, thing running smoothly. Those speakers are going to speak for about 20 minutes initially, then we'll open up the debate. And um, Lionel Sims is going to speak first, so I'll have straight over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me, comrades? Yes. When I originally um, asked or requested this debate, um, I requested the title of the debate be called Matriarchal Communism Discussion. That request was turned down on the grounds that comrades would not understand the term matriarchal communism and comrades would understand the title or it in the family. But I do wish to point out that I wish to introduce to the party a new theory that supports Engels' theory of primitive communism and I wish to emphasise that aspect of this theory, although the theory also does explain, in my view, a much more rigorous interpretation of the origin of the family than we are presently acquainted with. My purpose in all of this is to stand by our traditions and to support Engels. In the second preface to the origin of the family, Engels said this, the rediscovery of the original a matriarchal clan, although he used the term mother right or gens, and when I use the term matriarchy, which I have a habit of doing, I mean not the oppression of men by women, but complete equality between men and women. When I use the term matriarchy, that's what I mean. The rediscovery of the original matriarchal clan at the stage preliminary to the patriarchal clans of the civilised peoples has the same significance for the history of society as Darwin's theory of evolution has for biology, and Marx's theory of surplus value for political economy. It enabled Morgan to outline, for the first time, a history of the family. The matriarchal plan has become the pivot around which this entire science turns. Notice Engels is using the term science to apply to anthropology, and he's referring in particular to Lewis Henry Morgan, of course. What is a matriarchal plan? It is a group of men and women, brothers and sisters, who trace a common line of descent through a common line of mothers. As brothers, men are united with their sisters. As husbands, men are atomized. They visit their wives in another clan. Therefore, as husbands in a matriarchal clan society, men are weak. As brothers, men are strong in a matriarchal clan society. This is a very peculiar form of social organization and one that Engels identified as a primordial human society. So when I say we stand by our traditions and we support Engels, I say we support that vision of earliest humanity. And what does it feel like to live in matriarchal plan society? According to Engels, all are free and equal, including the women. This is what mankind and human society were like before class division arose. That's our tradition, if we stand by Engels. How did Engels explain the arising of a matriarchal clan society? He had two arguments. If you read The Origin of Family, Private Property and the State carefully, he had two arguments. One was an argument about incest avoidance. It's an extremely weak argument, and it was rejected correctly by Chris Harmon in the spring 1984 edition of the International Socialism Journal. I will therefore not delay the debate by discussing why we shouldn't have said the theory of incest avoidance as the way in which matriarchal man society arose. But there is a second argument that Engels used to explain the arising of a matriarchal man society. And this second argument has hardly ever been discussed in our party, and I know that Duncan is loath to engage, or very wary to engage, with his aspect of matriarchal I have it in writing, if anyone can test that. <laughs> and in this second argument, Engels quotes a primatologist, a man called Espinaz. And he quotes Espinaz on the nature of ape society. And because comrades do not know, in like last week, 
comment, I'll certainly not acquaint you with aspects of Engels. I'm going to read out, and I apologise, a long quote from Engels to show that Engels did discuss the nature of animal society and that this was crucial to understand how human society first arose. Animal societies have a certain value in drawing conclusions regarding human societies, but only in a negative sense. The higher vertebrates know only two forms of the family, polygamy or a single pair. In both cases, only one adult male, only one husband is permissible. The jealousy of the male, re remember it's animal society talking about, the jealousy of the male, representing both tie and limits of the family, the animal family, brings the animal family into conflict with the hall. By the hall, it means a higher collective of human society. The hall, the higher social form, is rendered impossible here among apes, loosened there or dissolved altogether during the mating season. At best, its continued development is hindered by the jealousy of the male. This alone suffices to prove that the animal family and primitive human society are incompatible things. That primitive man, working his way up out of the animal stage, either knew no family whatsoever, or at the most knew a family that is non-existent amongst animals. But evolution out of the animal stage, for the accomplishment of the greatest advance known to nature, an additional element was needed, the replacement of the individual's inadequate power of defense by the united strength and joint effort of the hall. The transition to the human stage out of conditions such as those under which the anthropoid apes live today would be absolutely inexplicable. These apes, rather than give the impression of being stray sidelines, gradually approach extinction, or at any rate, in process of decline. This alone is sufficient reason for rejecting all conclusions that are based on parallels drawn between their family forms and those of primitive man. Excellent. Excellent. Brilliant quote showing the ape society is the negation of human society, is the opposite of human society, because it is continually fragmented by the sexual jealousy of competing males. Now this is 1884, comrades, quoted Espinard. Incredible foresight from Engels. Why? Because while Engels' first theory of incest avoidance has been thoroughly discredited, as I said, Chris Harlan did this as well in spring 84 I so I will not deny that aspect of Engels. This part of Engels' argument has been thoroughly confirmed by all of primatology since. And the best reference I can give is a recent book by a primatologist called Robin Dunbar, Primate Social Systems, a brilliant book that confirms and elaborates Engels' argument. I now wish to quickly summarise a model, a simplified model of ape society. Why? Because when we know what holds back animal society, ape society, then we can construct a model on what we have to do to become human. And my argument is, we have to have a revolution such that matriarchal clans were established. But let's first summarise simply what a primate society looks like. First of all, there are female coalitions in ape society in which related groups of females, mothers, daughters and sisters, form groups, coalitions amongst themselves, by which they support their own offspring and each other and forage for each other and provide for each other. These are the strongest coalitions, these are the strongest groups in primate society. But there's a second system, also coexisting within primate society, and it's a system of competition amongst the males, with the males compete for sexual access and monopolization of the females. Therefore, there are two parallel systems going hand in hand in primate society. A sort of economic system, as I bracket that, a sort of economic system, in which the females forage and care for their own, themselves and their own offspring, and a male system, a competitive sexual solidity for the females. There is no division of labour between males and females in primate society. There is no mutual provisioning, mutual provisioning between the sexes. The males do not provide for the food for the females or for the infants. There is no division of labour of such a sort in primate society. On the contrary, what happens is that the males in primates compete on the basis of dominance, alpha dominance. A few males succeed in the competitive struggle to gain access to females. And these few males are called alpha males. Therefore, there is a crucial conflict and division within the males in primate society in which a few alpha males are dominant, but the majority of the males are subordinate and generally expelled by the alpha males. 
And these subordinate vowels are outliers, outsiders within the primate form. This leads to a crucial division of subsistence between the sexes in primate society. Female subsistence, see, I'm talking about apes, not human society. Female subsistence is overwhelmingly vegetarian, overwhelmingly. But the subordinate males are much more mobile than any of the other females or the alpha male. The alpha male jealously guards the females. He sits there, the great lump, jealously guarding his own females, making sure no other male has access to them. He is relatively immobilized by sexual monopolization of the females. But the subordinate males, who have no sexual rights, are outsiders and they are roamers. They are mavericks. And in their roamings, they have limited access to hunting meat. They hunt very unsuccessfully, and they, are, and they have not usually got a large part of meat as part of their subsistence. subsistence. But nevertheless, those subordinate males do have access to some meat. The females get their protein overwhelmingly through digging the termites with sticks and termite mounds. Therefore, there is a division between not only on the basis of sex, but on the basis of nutrition in primate society. In primate society, there is no home base. There is continual foraging, moving around, continually on the move, wandering foragers. Apes use tools, twigs, stones. Apes gather. Apes hunt. Apes also use sex as a medium of exchange because the females sexually solicit from males favours. And some of those favours are meat, some of them are safe sleeping places, some of them are protection. The females that are most successful in soliciting favours from the males are those that are in estrus, those that are sexually receptive. Therefore, estrus is the means by which the females sexually solicit favours from the males. And the males seek out estrus females. Therefore, you can distinguish, you can't distinguish apes from human society by tall use, because apes use tall. You can't distinguish apes by gathering, because apes gather. They hunt, but they hunt opportunistically, not collectively, and they are very unsuccessful in hunting. And apes also use sex as a medium of exchange. But notice, there is a key difference going on in, in all of this. The apes that have sexual rights are the alpha dominant males, and they are not the hunters. The apes who hunt have no sexual rights, because they are the expelled males and subordinate males. Therefore, there's not simply a difference between ape society and human society. There is an inversion between ape society and human society. There is a dialectical difference in which there is a, dip, there is a key disjunction between sexual rights and economic rights. Therefore, ape society, in a point-by-point -point correspondence, is negating what we understand by human society. And human society is the collective based in the village with collective hunting and a sexual division of labour. No ape society has that. Therefore, to move from one to the other, a revolution is necessary. A revolutionary overthrow of what divides the males in ape society, and that is competitive sexual solidity. Now, you may not like any of that, nevertheless. Let's read out some angles. <laughs> Mutual toleration among the adult males Freedom from jealousy was, however, the first condition for the building of those large and enduring groups in the midst of which alone the transition from animal to man could be achieved. Exactly. Now, the revolution that made us human was a hunting revolution, was an economic revolution, in which economics domesticated sexuality. Animal society is ruled by the drives of sexuality. Human society is ruled by the laws of economics, by an economic law. The first revolution, the first human revolution, was a hunting revolution. You cannot argue, as some comrades this week have tried to argue, that the difference between animals and humans is consciousness. Because when you say consciousness, what is first thought of is individual consciousness. That's what's first thought of when you first use that term. I'm sorry to say, comrades, that animals have consciousness in that sense. 
like a consciousness. But when Marx is using the term consciousness, we mean collective consciousness. We mean the consciousness of social organization. Now, if the first revolution was a hunting revolution, the problem there is not think of it carefully about it. Because animals hunt. When an animal makes a kill and eats that kill, it's hunting. Is that what we mean by human hunting? No, it's not at all. How do we distinguish animal from human society? By labor. And when we use the word collective consciousness, we're referring to the rules by which labor is organized. We stand by our traditions, Marx. In society, however, the relation of the producer to his product, as soon as it is completed, is an outward one. And the return of the product to the individual depends on his relations to other individuals. He does not take immediate possession of it. A hunter, a human hunter, does not take immediate possession of his product. Nor does the direct appropriation of the product constitute his purpose. When he produces in society, between the producer and his product, distribution steps in, determining by social laws his share in the world of products. That is to say, distribution steps in between production and consumption, exactly. Some rule of exchange must stand between the hunter and his gain for labor to begin. You see, if you say labor, it's not the sense of labor in terms of agricultural work, it's labor in the sense of hunting. If you say that hunting is not labor, then you're saying that hunting societies are not human. That's a terrible argument to make. And Marx is making the argument that labor is defined by a rule of exchange. You do not immediately consume your kill as a hunter. Society rules what happens to that kill. That's what Marx means by labor in hunting society. Anyone who disagrees with that is breaking with Marx. So, how can a hunting revolution begin? Jesus, five minutes. <laughs> 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 I haven't even got that one, mate. Well, I'll, I'll just go through the best I can. I'm now going to move on to theory which elaborates, notice, elaborates this part of Engels. So it's not new in the sense that it's going to come out of someone's brain and imposed on Engels. It comes out of this argument of angles that I've tried to elaborate. I have to skip out a few points from the preamble, but let's just get straight into it. This argument says that so long as primate society has sufficient vegetable foodstuffs, the male system of dominance and competition, alongside the female system of origin and coalitions, is quite okay. But as soon as vegetable supplies become short, either through climatic change or through moving to new areas, out of Africa, into Europe, for that change to take place, vegetable foraging would no longer provide sufficient subsistence to the females. And meat, the game of the hunt, becomes crucial to the nutrition of the females. How can the females get meat? The theory is very simple. This says one thing. The females say no to the males for sexual rights until the males bring them meat. See, up until that time, all of that society is females chasing males for, for any sort of support. This theory says that it turns it around and says the females form a coalition. Which females? The subordinate females. And they say to the males, which males? The subordinate males, those who have access to meat. Come into an alliance with us, and you will get for the first time sexual rights, marital rights, in return for being economically useful. It's a rule of exchange, exactly what Marx is saying is necessary for hunting society to begin. Now, if one female said, nothing doing, bud, clearly she's onto a loser. Because another female might say yes. Therefore, this is not an individualistic strategy, but it's only a strategy work that works through a coalition of females. How can a coalition of females emerge from animal society? Very simple, by sibling solidarity. We are genetically related, as close to our siblings as we are to our own offspring. Therefore, a strategy such as a sex strike, in which sisters or mothers and daughters are supporting each other, 
is just as much biologically evolutionary worthwhile strategy as a strategy of own offspring theories. Therefore, sibling solidarity does not defy biological laws. It's, it's built on those very same biological laws. Therefore, culture, as it begins in hunting society and biology, are not in conflict. But something new has entered history. For the first time in history, solidarity is beginning. By a revolutionary overthrow of male dominance. The eighth system of sexual solidity is based on an estrus cycle. An estrus cycle is a hormonal dominant period during which the females come into sexual heat and cannot say no to sex. That is therefore a yes signal. After estrus, the females are generally unsafe, uninterested in sex. It's a no signal. If there's going to be a human revolution, based upon a hunting revolution, sex must be under cortical control. Now remember, I'm talking about the dawn of time. I'm not talking about London, 1990. I'm talking about the dawn of time. But everyone misunderstand me. I'm talking about the Paleolithic, the little Paleolithic to be precise. You would expect such a revolution to be reflected in the biology human beings, and of course it is, because there is only one hormonal signal, signal in the sexual cycle of female, of, ma of humanity, and that is menstruation. And menstruation in tribal society, in all tribal societies, in traditional societies, is a signal for no sex. Now again, remember what I'm saying, not today, 1990, in Yulu building, I'm not referring to anyone here in particular. <laughs> I'm referring to tribal society, comrades. I know this evidence is unusual and some people find it threatening. They're going to have to handle that. They're going to have to handle that and read the evidence. Because the elaboration of menstrual taboos in tribal society is amazing. And it's a near universal in the anthropological record. And anyone who says it's not is just confessing their ignorance of the evidence. Now, menstruation is a no signal. There's something more about menstruation, and it's called the McClintock effect. It was recognized in the medical literature by a male doctor in the early 1970s. And the McClintock effect is a spontaneous synchronization of the menstrual cycle of women who are in close contact with each other. This is not debatable, this is established in the medical literature. It's known by many women before, of course, the doctors discovered it, but nevertheless, it's now a tested medical fact. According to this theory, synchronized menstrual menstruation of a collective of females is a hormonal trace of a biological pre-adaptation which was useful for females to signal into males that they were unavailable for sex. Blood is taboo. In tribal society, there was an incredible elaboration in ritual and in law around every point at which blood is spilt. So again, this is not unusual at all in the anthropological literature. <coughs> This time that I'm talking about, I'm nearly finished, but this time that I'm talking about, hunters live in condition of the mass plenty of large game. Before the Middle Paleolithic, our species, or rather our archaic predecessors, were not very effective hunters. Between 90 and 50,000 years ago, the archaeologists have shown we became extremely effective hunters. Large game drives, collective hunting of driving large game over cliffs or into swamps meant masses of game could be killed in large quantities at any one hunt. Therefore, the conditions we're talking about are conditions of mass plenty of game. Hunting was not driven by hunger. Hunting was driven 
by the laws of society, so that when they wanted to hunt, they decided to hunt. And they knew there was no problem whatsoever in getting game when they went out to hunt. That again has been shown clearly by Marshall Sarling in his book Stone Age Economics. For a hunting party to carry out a hunt, I've, got, I've just been told to stop for two minutes. So, for a hunt to carry out for a large game, this takes days. To carry out a hunt over a number of days in which the game is to be tracked, a period has to be chosen which is most propitious for the conduct of that hunt. Again, in all tribal societies, and as has been shown by Marshak and amazingly by Malinowski, all of them show that the moment for the hunt, the times chosen for the hunt, the best times are always the times of the waxing moon. Now, when I mention the moon, I'm going to go even more do that. Menstruation. Because of course we have a horrible tradition to oppose, a mystical Mother Earth tradition, and comrades get confused that I am identifying with that, and they're completely misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm drawing from the anthropological literature. Now these comrades who go about in cars with headlights don't have any problem with getting around at night. But in tribal society, where there are no streetlights, to hunt game at night, you would have to be a complete idiot not to know about the cycles of the moon. You'd have to be a complete fool. And the time of the waxing moon, the waxing moon rises two hours before sunset, rising up to the full moon. Therefore, you choose that half of the lunar cycle to be the two weeks during which you would organise the hunt. Now, there's another fact about the menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle, the average... The average menstrual cycle of all women all over the world is 29.5 days. Now, some time will say, that's not the length of my cycle. I'm talking about the average for all of the world's women. All right? now, again, it's established in the medical literature. 29.5 days is exactly the lunar cycle. No other primate has a menstrual cycle of 29.5 days. This theory, comrades, explains how the economics of the hunt and sexual exchange interconnect to create the solidarity of males and females that is impossible in a society. Sorry, I'm not too long. Because no other primate has a menstrual cycle. No <laughs> but seriously, seriously, I also wish to commend Marxist tradition, in particular, what is valuable in Engels' work, but I want to do so not on the basis of the 19th century science, which Engels was compelled to do himself to, but on the basis of what has subsequently been discovered, and when I say discovered, I refer not to what I regard as rather speculative anthropological theories, but some indisputable facts. Now let's start with the basic question. What do we mean by human? What distinguishes us from all other animals, primate or not? It is something called culture. Culture meaning a tradition. A tradition which we do not inherit genetically, we are not born speaking English or Chinese or whatever, but we inherit through society, through social groups, and it involves necessarily, first and foremost, as Marx says, the actual context of the Bible can be used. He used another one, he says, early on German ideology, you can be meant to be distinguished from uh, other creatures by religion, consciousness, anything you want, this is the quotation, man begins to distinguish himself when he begins to produce his means of subsistence. And man is quite right in saying hunting and gathering is a mode of production, it is not simply a parasitic way of life. That's right. You know, Gordon Charles summed it up beautifully in, in the title of the book in three words, man makes himself. That is to say, 
and they served the stage in the course of primate evolution much longer ago than that was quite a larger place, but since he hasn't made the hardest place, he hasn't made these points and he's going into it, actually a mode of production comes into existence. That's the central thing. Now then, the question of sociobiology and the study of eight societies or what happened. Now then, I've read two books by Jane Goodall on chimpanzees. She's dead, unfortunately, with the lady who's good. And they are very interesting. And they told me anyway, a lot too. They told me a lot about chimpanzee society. <laughs> not at all about humans. <laughs> Why not? Because not only are we not chimpanzees, we are distinguished from chimpanzees and all other animals precisely by the possession of a cultural tradition. A tradition which is handed down in society, not genetically inherited. How old is this? It's very old. I'll, I'll, I'll simply say very briefly. How do we know? How can we say? When did human society come into existence? When material artifacts, which still survive, right, can be discovered and can be shown to be. But it is not a question of true beauty. I know I've seen the pictures of chimpanzees throwing sticks at uh, leopard or model leopard and so on and so forth. That's not the cultural tool making. The manufacture of tools and by implication other things too, according to standard patterns. Standard patterns involve culture, a tradition, involve speech, as Plakhanov said long, long ago. Social cooperation and so on and so forth. Now then, sociobiology therefore must be rejected. The fact that Engels uses this argument is an illustration of the undeveloped state, unfortunately, of science at the time. He was simply expected to use the argument. Nothing can be inferred from primate societies directly about human societies, but for all matters, for all primates, that is relevant in this context. Certainly, no argument based on analysis there tells us anything. Finally, on this thing, there is no such thing as primate nature, male dominated or otherwise. There are, getting on for 200 living species of primates, they are very, very physically in their behavior patterns, including their sexual behavior patterns, very enormously. There ain't no such thing. No. In a certain sense, we can say there is something called human nature, nor is there any fixed and unchanging human nature. Marx said, what is called human nature is the ensemble, the coming together of human social relations. Again, that does not occur in the most most intelligent age, because you don't have culture, they don't have speech, they don't have a social tradition. So it is more than such an age, especially when we don't want to talk about that, but it is essential. Now let us look at the sex strike theory. I'm, I'm using that as a abbreviation. I don't want to be offensive at all. But the notion that the transition, the crucial transition from pre-human to human society is uh, connected with this problem of sexual relations and so on and so forth. Now, you know, it won't do. It really won't do. Of course it's true that we can tell very little about directly about social relations in early human societies because we can't do it because the remains that they make if you, uh, they leave, you can make inferences from them but they don't directly tell you anything about such relations how do we can say something with reasonable certainty about such things first of all judging by the known remains all groups were relatively small in the hunter gatherer state true Certain times, quite large numbers could come together, but the groups were small. Three, like all other human groups at all known times, they were composed of men and women in broadly equal numbers. Yes, because that is their genetic inheritance. Three, that at no stage did you get any kind of systematic segregation between men and women. I'm talking about free class societies in general, not together societies in particular. Now, this is important because this whole argument about uh, control of the menstrual cycle and so on and so forth. The evidence that Lyman cites about a certain tendency in certain circumstances for women's cycles to come closer together, that's all valid. But what is that evidence derived from? From studies of women in prison, first of all, from studies of women in convents, and from actually some of it, it's done in North America, 
from study of women in these segregated old women hostels in all women colleges. Now, we can say with confidence, none of those institutions then existed. <laughs> Here you have an incredible small group of males and females, mixed and so on, and certainly they reproduced or we wouldn't be here, but we can't say anything at all about the, the synchronization thing. The synchronization really is a red It is not only on demand, it can't be demonstrated, it's inherently causal when we look at the nature of the groups. Consequently, there is no reason whatsoever to suppose that in any other society you got the development of that degree of separate consciousness by women which leads to the bargaining situation. But the fact of the matter is, of course, that at different times, depending on different external conditions, the relative importance of plant and animal food varied enormously at uh, different times. Right, though, in saying that hunting is important. Why? Why is hunting important in terms of the evolution of not only human society, but actually the physical evolution? Because it depends on social cooperation. Now, not 90 or 100,000 years ago, I see the dates got extended backwards, of course, 50,000. But vastly further than that, large-scale hunting was carried out. Now, I will simply quote, for the sake of uh, completeness here, an authority who is in no sense dependent on me, the other way around. Uh, Clark, the author of what was the least the standard text with the outline of free history of church, he was dated 10 years, of, more than 10 years, the latest edition. But he is speaking about men. They are men, by my definition, cultural true makers people, right? Reliably dated to about 700,000 years ago, and that doesn't depend on ideology, on expected offshoot of nuclear physics, the passing argument, dating, and so on and so forth. Right? Reliably dated. Here we have an account uh, specifically about what is known about their way of life. To judge by the social remains associated with it, meat and man depended largely on medicine, since two thirds of the animal remains belong to just two species of deer. Perhaps that's an illusion. Perhaps that, uh, that's all that was around. And therefore, its significance for organization is not real. Not so. But he goes on to give a list, and it's too long to read, about the other animal remains, bones typically charred, by the way, these people have to go the use of fire, whether they could make it or not, they used it. Uh, the other is a long, a long list. Two species of elephant, not the current species, two species of rhino, swine, including a giant species, bison, water buffalo, and some carnivores, including a, sa a saber tooth cat, and a cat indistinguishable skeleton anyway from the modern leopard, etc., etc. Now, it is entirely possible that much of this mixed bag was scavenged. Yes, I mean, I don't want to exclude that possibility at all, but come on! Two-thirds of the consumption, meat consumption, we don't know much about that. Two-thirds of the meat consumption, just two kinds of deer, and there are other kinds around. That means purposeful hunting, right? Long, long before the theory of when I saw it and I was I was arguing with someone for a night. Long before this, now then, and Clark makes this comment because the two men in my again, technicality, he has a scheme, a five fold scheme, you see, a two five, simplified two classification, were amongst the most things. The meagerness of his material equipment only emphasizes the important fact that teamwork, based on articulate speech and on a conscious network of social relations, must have played even at this early stage of development. So that is absolutely right. He keeps saying he. What we, we ought to have the system of trees, we ought to be able to say it. Because, of course, half these societies, or whereabouts, must have been composed of women. And the notion that ever you had a situation where men go and hunt and then gorge themselves on this elephant cliff, scavenge, let us say, whereas the poor women don't get it yet, except on the basis of sexual favors, there's not a scrap of evidence for this. One evidence we have 
from surviving groups that survived long enough for relatively objective uh, observation from the outside, which means late 19th, early 20th century, purely hunter gathering groups, is that after each kill, there is a most elaborate distribution of the product according to rules which presumably have some rationale, but which are rules, you know, both sexes, all ages, participants, non-participants. Now, since Lionel knows the literature, he knows that is true. You can argue, but that's reason. What evidence have we that it's reason? You think about it, it is functional for goodness sake. You know, for the million or so years that human society has existed, half of it's been female, and that half has always been crucial, because in terms of the reproduction of the group, the women are indispensable. You can manage with one or two men with a lot of good. From a purely physical point of view, I think. You can't manage with a lot of men with one or two women. Come on, the group simply dies out. And consequently, the nourishment of women and their offspring from the beginning. Absolutely indispensable to the survival. If there were groups which did not do that, if there were groups where this alleged primate nature ensured that males gorged themselves and females relatively starved out or went to grubbing for roots, etc., particular groups, then men ain't paid them too. If there were such groups, I tell you, they would disappear over time in competition with those groups which actually ensure the distribution of the available foodstuffs of all kinds to both sexes. Question here, obviously, of social selection. Now, I haven't said all this, let's get on to April. Have I missed something now? Uh, no. I don't have uh, all the other sex stuff. I was simply saying it is an unverifiable hypothesis which is inherently unlikely. One. And two, it is in no way necessary to explain the situation that we know existed, whereby the status of women in certainly early agricultural societies, we have to say this because it's from then we've got most of the evidence, you know, the Neolithic Revolution, the discovery of agriculture produced a population explosion, and consequently, you know, it's often been quoted, but it's still the case, all the the remains, the physical remains, not the tools, we've got massive tools, all the physical remains of all Stone Age hunters could be accommodated in one large room. Since then, remains from some of the places in that very enormous quantity. These societies, and here we come to them, were undoubtedly made to any of there's no argument about that, I mean, come on, those societies must have been made to any of all of them. Why? The importance of kinship, yep, the importance of kinship. You see, I said we know nothing directly about their social relations. All the later primitive societies that have been absorbed and observed depend on kinship relations. And kinship relations depend on real or supposed descent from common ancestors. All of them actually have elaborate incest rules. Forget about the modern notion of incest. It really has nothing to do with this. That is to say, since there are classification about who you can and who you can't have institutionalized sexual relations uh, with. Rigorously in words. Nothing to do with the modern immigrant species. I'm one of the earliest uh, students of the thing in Australia, and Morgan folks and through Morgan Angels, pointing out very early on, it is astonishing. <laughs> Christian, you know, he's all like the Bible and so on. And he took him an anomaly study. Actually, in some cases, it is entirely permissible to have sexual relations with quite close relatives, first cousins and so on, but entirely impermissible to have such relations with quite remote relatives, people who for a common ancestor, you've got to go back several generations. It's not rational. Yes, it is rational. It is rational because whatever the precise mechanisms of its origin, incest prohibitions of the kinship system are tied together and they function to do two things. One, to regulate relations between groups, to minimize friction between groups. Why is that important? Again, it's not a question of people's intentions, what's in their heads. 
when he developed this, the less friction, the less conflict, the more successful you will be. That's why the system persists, develops social revolution. Secondly, and of course the people concerned in the world, it involves all the time bigger interchange of genetic material than would otherwise occur, which is also actually in the interest of the group, even though they didn't know it. Now what they say about it, why it's forbidden and so on, and why this is permitted, is irrelevant. It is ideology. Yes, it is ideology. It is their explanation of a phenomenon which is central to their life. We have to look at it from the other point of view, what actual function does it uh, fulfill? Now then, we look at, and that's why, you know, metrilineal society, absolutely no question. You can argue about who was or who was not the father. Who the mother was is transparent. Especially in a small group, you know, they can't live up to your hospital, somewhere else, or anything like this. Oh, no, it's obvious to the mother. Hence, metrilineal. Secondly, all those early Neolithic societies emerging from the hunter gatherer stage had a high state. All those know. Able to be absolutely right on this. The vast mass of material accumulated, denigrated, ignored by bourgeois scholars for a long time. Not all bourgeois scholars. All that's right, and it's connected, not simply with measure anything. It's connected with the fact that the property, broadly defined, is clan property. It is collective. And if you have matrilineal descent, then of course, and the men marry out, they don't actually mean that to leave them, they all marry off. Then of course it's in the hands of with a female collective. This is exactly Morgan's description of the Iroquois society, which, by the way, for the many of the sentimental people, was not a nice, friendly, peaceful society. They were the country, right? Warlike society, nevertheless. The years ago its origin to 3,000 for certain and probably a thousand years before that in terms of development, the gradual emergence of private property, the state and so on. Abel is absolutely right in saying this was the world historic defeat of the female state. Absolutely right. All that stands. What does not stand in Abel's is the argument from terminology. You know, the hypothetical scheme which Morgan and others constructed about how this happened over time. Because it depends on language. You know the argument briefly? Anyone who's looked at the origin of the family will. The terms they use don't correspond to the actual relations. Thus, amongst the Iroquois, I call all female relatives of a certain generation mother. I didn't mean to say I don't know the difference. Right? The argument was this relates back to a period, I hope I haven't time, I'm sorry to show up to go through, then ultimately to promiscuous relations and so on. The argument won't do for a very simple reason. It is conceivable, I mean, it's a bit abstract anyway, but it is conceivable that you can have ideology, in this case, forms of speech persisting for thousands of years after the condition uh, to which they gave rise have passed away. Thousands. <coughs> Million years? Come on, I mean, that is to contradict the whole theory of the No, that was a red herring, as it turns out. And of course, precisely that, the bourgeois critics of a group are focused upon. It does not alter at all the existence of what Lionel calls, and I've set the term, the matrilineal communist clan system. Doesn't alter that at all. We have problems about how it came into existence, yes, but that it existed is certain that it is integrated by the evolution of private property which is associated with changes in techniques of production and the emancipation of men, if you like, from the control of a collective. That collective being essentially female. Okay, comrades, let's get the debate underway. I'll ask people to hold our seats. First of all, please speak briefly so we can get as many people in as possible. The first speaker is going to be Charlie Hall, and he'll be followed by Liz Knight. Yeah, I'll make two brief points. 
about the notion of the sex drive itself, because there is a real problem. And I think it goes a little further than being simply a little implausible. At the heart of the notion, the thing that makes the thing work, is the idea of the blood to boom, that the hunters will not bring the meat back to the hunters. The hunters have to bring the meat back to the home base of the fire in order for it to be cooked, because menstrual blood, like animal blood, is seen as somehow to boom. And there is a real problem, because at the heart, the explanatory notion, at the heart of this idea, is a pure theory, a concept, which is developed apparently out of thin air. What's the material base? of this idea. We're not, you know, we're not, it's some, it somehow simply emerges at the heart of the concept. Changes in human ideas, and we are talking about human beings, because to, in order to develop this range of concepts, we're talking about people with a certain, a certain linguistic sophistication, a certain cultural development. Changes in ideas determine changes in human society. Now that is not what we're about, that is the precise opposite of the Marxist method. And the second point I want to make is very simply this. And it's about the line of talk about the problems when you talk about the moon of making the confusion between of making the confusion between all the sorts of mystical, radical feminist nonsense we get. Now I want to quote very briefly from Chris Knight's pamphlet about to see what you know, because I think actually there is a confusion and there is and there is at the heart of there is a concession at the heart of it. Very simply this. The strike transcends the identity of physical individuals. If participants may not yet be priestesses, breach is certainly the representative and overriding social power. If the strike strike can extend indefinitely, in principle it is omnipresent in the natural symphony, then in embodying this power, each woman stands for something transcendental. She stands for her sisters, who may be potentially limitless in number. And if men respect this power, then although they need acknowledge no divinity, there is present here at least something of the formal structure of religious deference to human beings. If, uh, but their strike is periodically renewed, as is their lifeblood which flows from generation to generation. Moreover, in menstruation, they do seem to accompany the moon to its own temporary death, moving into another realm from which they later return. Now, I, I think there is a, I think there is there a quite serious confusion between the methodology, between the methods of radical feminism, which we back from myth and legend, which we back from myth and legend, and our own method, which attempts to construct from the basis of the available evidence what we can try to what we can what we can what we can try to understand. And I want to suggest in conclusion that actually there is a real if we start if we accept the basic idea, then we are in very real danger of turning over our understanding of the dance of human society and consequently the, the family, private property and the state. Because we start from basis, it is changes in human ideas, changes in human understanding, which produce changes in human, produce changes in real material circumstances. It, just, it seems to me, actually we have to start off, it is the, the development of the home base, the ability of the ability of human beings or, or homies to control fire really disappear entirely in this theory. It seems to me if we can have an explanation, actually they have to start there. Two points. Just one very brief on the last conclusion. That's what we have to explain is how culture and labour and consciousness grow by what social process to grow. Um, and this theory is an attempt to explain an area that just has not been explained. Um, so what I want to go on to is um, how, I, how I think that these new ideas actually help us and strengthen us in our struggle against patriarchal theory. The SWP is, the, uh, is now the only organisation which consistently fights and is in the forefront of the fight against women's oppression. And we understand that they're not two struggles, there's not one in the home against women's oppression and one outside the workplace. There, and there's one struggle, and that's the class struggle, and there are campaigns around that and so on are, are a, a recognition of our fighting understanding of that fact. Patriarchal theory does not deny that relationship. It says there are two separate struggles. One of women who've always been oppressed in the family, and one um, social standards would accept and other things as well that there is a class struggle, but that's separate from women's oppression in the home. They oppose all men as eternally oppressing all women. It's a deeply pessimistic theory because it's actually ultimately based on biological determinism, that in some way women's biology, the fact that we have responsibility for maternity and childcare, has limited us throughout history, including the beginning of history, and that it's that which is determined um, from then forward and through to our society our, our oppression. That's what women, that's what patriarchal theory basically says. Now, the the um, problem of patriarchal theory is not just that feminists have this idea, and so we we, um, we like to argue with them. As, as, as you understand, it's, it's not, that's not really the argument, basically. It's because 
his idea, the idea of the patriarchy here, he actually deeply rooted in a kind of common sense view of human nature, the idea that family will always be with us, human nature can't change, men will always protect women, and uh, socially, it's impossible, it's just a utopia, because nothing, no society has ever existed where women have been equal. We actually use every argument we have, use every evidence that we can to argue against, against those ideas which hold back struggle for socialism, hold back the class struggle. Those are the questions that are always being asked. Why was it men rather than women who did appropriate the service rather than class society? Um, if it wasn't for biological reasons, if it wasn't because women uh, were unable to uh, hold a plow, as some comics have argued, if it wasn't that because uh, w women uh, are more immobile, if it wasn't because women were uh, separated from animal husbandry because of uh, looking after the children, then what were the reasons why, um, why it was men who took control of the service? You've got to go further back in order to, in order to uh, be able to answer those questions adequately. And this theory attempts to do that, and it attempts to show that actually we were born in communism, that when we became human, it was through women taking social control of our sexuality, of our biology, and through that, um, forging solidarity, which then forged mm -hmm. solidarity throughout the society, we were born in communism, and any theory which suggests that, I think, as revolutionists, we should be interested in. The way to learn and to grow is to learn. Strictly to what I put on the speaker's slip, but in any case, I'm trying to brief. There are some problems for me in this, this whole argument. And this, the, one of the most fundamental problems is this notion of apes and humans. Now, I'd like somebody to, to answer this question as definitively as it's possible to answer it. But my understanding of the most modern view of where we came from is not that we descend from apes but that both of us, apes and humans, descend from some common ancestor. Now it seems to me that what Lionel was saying only holds up if you can prove that that common ancestor <coughs> should it only has any possibility of holding up. If you can prove that that common ancestor had the same characteristics as he um, rather uh, comprehensively attributed to all primates, uh, apart from human beings. So that's the first problem I've got. The second problem is this business of, uh, well, Lionel kept using the word matriarchal. Um, it was Duncan who introduced the word matrilineal. As I understand it, Ingalls couldn't tell the difference. And that was one of the, the problems that he had. Matrilineality is, is uh, based on the, the, the business that you know who someone's mother is, but you can't necessarily tell them who the father is. But there could be more to it than that, of course, and, and maybe some uh, members and, and uh, the speakers would like to comment on this. In Chobrian society, not only is this the case, but they don't understand whatever the relationship between sex and reproduction. Now this is a, a very important thing, because I think it goes to the heart of um, some of this business about menstruation. You know, we're, we're constantly there is, is, is there is a confusion or, or a sort of failure to fully elaborate the distinction between sexual activity and reproductive activity. It is not necessarily the case that the first human beings knew the connection. After the lamp, and when the Chobrians were actually, actually had to explain to them, they refused to believe it because of culture. Because it had become firmly established that sex was a sort of game that you played between the sexes, as it were, a pleasurable activity, and reproduction took place in another way. As a matter of fact, it had something to do with babies coming through the mother's head, or, or you know, spiritually, or, or some sort of nonsense like that. But anyway, that's, that's the essence of the thing. Uh, so I want to explain the, the difference between matriarchy and matrilineality has not been fully elaborated. elaborated since. And I think what Engels says about the, the world historical defeat of the female sex is frankly nonsense. 
is complete and utter rubbish because it is not based on sound, sound enough evidence, right? That is just nonsense. Um, and, you know, until I hear more convincing evidence about it, I shall continue to think it's nonsense. Um, yeah, I just want to defend Engels, actually. So what annoys me about the debate is the way that um, it's presented as though these are new, modern, particularly penetrating concepts which really Marxism can't handle. You know, really they're progressive, you know, that they handle some of the points in history where, you know, frankly, if you're a dialectician, you know, you have to, you have to give up, really. There's no real way by being Marxist. That you can that you can um, that you can understand these things. Now you see, I think the way Lionel presented his argument was very very clever indeed, because he marks essentially a reactionary method in in the detail of uh, of, of the of the uh, of the events uh, revolution he talked about. He only once mentioned quite cleverly, I think, Salus, you know, as a as a, as a uh, you know right wing socio socio biologist. And then he, even though in the meetings when you talk about the right wing socio, you know, the right the right wingers or, and the socio biologists, what you find is that, um, that, that people say, look, we have nothing to do with socio biology. I'll, I'll talk about what, what I mean by what I can say. We have nothing to do with socio uh, socio biology. We're, we're, we're completely different. But the other thing that was was uh, was uh, slipped in was this notion of uh, of sibling solidarity. This is a, this is a is a central idea of the sociobiologists, so that really we are blind, automatic carriers of our genes, and that really, in terms of the adaptive, you know, history, the way we came to be what we are, really it's the notion of the, of the gene, you know, the, this is the central piece of information that we, which, which we strive to defend, to spread, you know, to make as uh, reproductively effective as possible. Now, not long we just slip this in, you know, it talks a little bit about sibling solidarity. Sibling solidarity is at the centre of all, all of the sociobiologists. The right-wing sociobiologists and those who claim that they're they're they are, they're, uh, they're modern, modern and uh, essentially essentially uh, essentially progressive. You know, because it is the argument that basically all social behaviour, you know, no matter how complex, all culture is essentially derived from the drive of the gene itself. You know, that really can explain all complex phenomena. And and in Lyman's case, it's you know, to try and explain cooperation with the, and, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the modern part of society through, through, uh, through genetic material. And it's, and it's an old trick. Basically, you start off with the traits that you want to explain inside human society, and you, and you, uh, and you, uh, and you create a story, essentially, a story about history that explains the progress of this gene through time. And that essentially, it's a reactionary, oh, all I want to say is that it's, a, it's a, a, a reactionary method that the sociobiologists use time and time again. You know, really, it's like saying, you know, 99% of things are Lutherans. Therefore, there's a gene that uh, predisposes you for being a Lutheran. You know, you look at a trait, you want to explain the trait, the only way you can do it is by really saying, you know, think, invoking things like sibling solidarity, we're really the blind carriers of, 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 of our genes. Actually, there is absolutely no, there's absolutely no direct evidence to support these claims. Sibling solidarity, you know, the way that we're really driven by our genes, you can't test for it, you cannot locate the genes, you cannot locate the genes to give rise to the sort of behaviour that, uh, that uh, Lionel just slips in as, uh, as an incidental to his argument. It's central he shares it with the right-wing sociobiology. <laughs> Can I hear the applause at the end of this night's contribution? And that actually gives the game away. Because what did people applaud when this night said that the development of human society was predicated on women taking control of their sexuality? And that's where the applause came from. I understand that because, of course, we all aspire, particularly women, to control our own sexuality in our bodies. My contention is that Lionel Sinti's argument based on Chris Knight, which is actually the theorisation of women at Queen of Common Law, it is fundamentally reactionary, absolutely reactionary, and completely and
no reason to suppose that men did not whip women's weeks. That is a reactionary ideology imported uh, uh, back onto uh, back onto prehistory. But what is another reactionary uh, importation backwards into uh, into prehistory? Is the notion that women didn't like sex. Very common to radical feminism. Thank you very much. Have some level of inequality. And I don't think we can explain the figure that the entire 87% is 
simply by colonial impact, because some of the societies, for example, the Barrier of New Guinea, um, were actually made contact with quite late, and there is evidence of um, women's pressure before that. And what I really want to say is we can't carry on ignoring the evidence. But what I think we, we have got to develop a serious explanation which can account for it. And I think the model that Lionel has outlined is an attempt to do this in a way which still links the origins of women's oppression with the emergence of the class society. And I think that's something that everybody is ignoring. It links it completely with the origins of the class society. But in a way, it actually strengthens our arguments against the patriarchy theory. <laughs> Yeah, I want to respond to Liz Mike's question about why uh, the whole question of why it would be men that would take control of the surplus in the rise of class society because this comes up very often in arguments um, with social feminists and a whole range of uh, arguments with feminists. Okay, I think there's a tendency to see it as a question of men versus women. See, why was it the men that were in control as opposed to the women? Not looking at the structure of society to just sort of generalize that from today, where we have you know men in the ruling class and men in the working class sort of look somewhat similar in relationship to the family. But I think that the importance of Engel's book is that he pointed out that it was a new organization of society with the domestication of animals and a tremendous increase in productivity of labor, the increase in production, the increase in population that Duncan talks about. The old clan organization based on kinship couldn't hold up anymore. It broke down. And a new organization of society, based on their kinship and their classes, came about. And therefore, there had to be new rules of transmission of property. So there used to be that if a person died, their, their spears or their basket or whatever it was they had would go to the clan. But if the clan society is no longer there, then, you know, how are you going to transfer the property? And the point is that it has to remain within the class. If the, if the whole society is now based on only huge herds of animals, um, the animals have to stay within the ruling class. And Engel points out that the question of a new mode of production based on slavery is really key in understanding the rise of the family. Because now, instead of having a group of people who are all related, who all work, they're all related by kinship, you have a system of classes where, okay, at the top you have a property owning husband, wife, their children, whatever, maybe several generations, whatever, but also large numbers of slaves who are doing the property, who are doing the production. Engel points out that the word family derives from the word fabulous and slave in Roman times. So the whole point is to keep the property within the family. If, uh, within the class, I'm sorry. If, uh, and this means restriction on women's sexuality. So if a woman, in, if the property only wife could, was free to have whatever sexual relations she wanted, then there's a possibility that the property becomes unclear, you know, if the father is a slave, whatever. It just confused, you know, confuse everything. The property, the basic point is that the property has to be kept within the class and not some simplistic idea of men as men, women as women, generalizing that from today. <laughs> Right, okay, well, I, don't, I really think we have to knock on the head this ridiculous idea that this theory helps us in the fight against patriarchy. What are those nonsense? The theory that says that unless women make men go out and do it, not only would they not bring the meat home, but they go out and do their hunting in the pitch black in the middle of the night when they couldn't study sea anything. It's not the No, we are not, you know, what? It's a complete abandonment. Of, 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 of what Engels wrote. Yeah. You want to defend the little bit that Engels said that actually he was mistaken about. In the process, you want to throw out what was central to this whole bloody argument, which was rooting the development of relations between men and women and the state and private property in the, in the development of class society, in the, in the development of the forces of production and the way that people organise socially together in order to get food out of the ground. That really doesn't come into your theory at all. Let's throw it all down. Well, that's not what happened. It happened because we synchronised their periods with the moon. I mean, come on. That's a complete bloody joke. It's a complete load of mystical nonsense. Of course we say that biology was important. We say that it was important in the context of, of, of its relation to the forces of production. Now, this might be characterise it, caricature it, as our women, what women couldn't manage the power. But actually, there was a direct relationship between when biology was important and what the actual levels of the productive forces were, what sort of tools and machinery you were using, what, uh, uh, so on and so forth. That is a materialist explanation. The alternative is a biological reductionist explanation. It's an attempt to explain everything in terms of biology, and it is completely reactionary. And to be 
if I agree with Keith's attack on the social budget, I the inability of Stalin is not the real example of social budget, but I'll point you for a social budget, but not a bus route, and does refer to, and say that unlike all the reactionary racist social budgets like Wilson and uh, all the ones we know of, this guy, Richard Dawkins, is actually a really nice liberal and that we should look at his ideas. Let's, I'll just give you some examples of where his ideas come from. These, these biological, you know, mating patterns and, and sexual drives and urges that we're all bound to, that we're all, that we're all made of from. How do you work out who to mate with who? Should you mate with your first husband or second or third husband? Patrick Bateson had tried to ask Japanese quail where their preferences lie. I'm oh, just picturing where he's looking at what Japanese quail thinks. I know what Japanese quail do. Then we have adolescent male lions and what they do. And then we have chimpanzees and gorillas. And then we have both dispersal patterns, that is those of the lions and the chimpanzees and gorillas, as well as the quail system, are to be found among various cultures of our own species. That's brilliant. So we've got people of quail. Mobilise, please, comrades. To mobilise 
a division of labour and social cooperation between sexes that does not exist in the animal kingdom. Now, it, she also suggested that I was arguing that men don't want to cooperate and therefore women, somehow or other, have to make them cooperate. That's not what the sex right theory is saying. What the sex right theory is saying is that an alliance takes place through a revolution, this is what a revolution is, an alliance, a revolution, an alliance takes place between females and previously subordinate males under the old primate system. So it is a new unity that does not exist in primate society that is forged in a revolutionary overthrow of primate rules of sexual dominance. I'm very sorry that comrades find it difficult to engage with the idea of building a model from primate society, which is no, which is where we began, to the simplest human configuration of a division of labour, central place foraging, and logistical hunting. That's the simplest human configuration. We build models. Of course we have to build abstract models for something that no longer exists. But these are the minimum requirements of human society. Keith Fisher uh, uh, said that Sarlins was a right-wing sociobiologist. We may be reading different people, comrade, but Marshall Sarlins is actually a Marxist anthropologist in America. So I'm sorry, I've been talking about different people, I think. Well, when I quote Sarlins about Stone Age economics, and by the way, James Gould is not dead, in case anyone was worried. Uh, so, now, before I this point about sibling solidarity, sibling solidarity is crucial. Why? Because it is the heart of the matriarchal plan. Brothers and sisters united in clans is what a matriarchal plan is all about. Therefore, when we look to sociobiology, we don't transfer the laws of biology to human society. On the contrary, because what in ape society stands on top of sibling solidarity? Our predominance. It has to go. Therefore, it's not an extension of the rules of sociobiology, it's an overthrow of the rules of sociobiology with a cultural revolution which at the same time includes those biological constraints, the dialectical combination of the two. It's a revolutionary overthrow. Therefore, this theory, comrades, is built upon major advances that are taking place in archaeology, primatology and anthropology. These writers now call our making of humanness a human revolution. They are using the word revolution. This is an amazing and ironic change in what have previously been the most, most reactionary bourgeois discipline. Comrades, be strong. Read these new sources and make up your own mind because they're part of our tradition and we claim them. To be fair, I have read quite a bit of it. In part, due to arguments uh, with the uh, Bible. And I think it would increase the astonishment of incredulity. You see, it does not follow that because some idea has originated from recently, therefore, necessarily, it is correct. But as a matter of fact, he's got it the wrong way round. You know, age has many penalties without one advantage. I can remember. And I'll decide the work, Clark's first well-known work on savagery and civilization, written in the late, late 40s, which adopted exactly the late view of the, the, the late dating for the evolution of human society. It all comes with Homo sapiens, you know, the current uh, African genesis stuff on the African Eden and so on and so forth. That was the orthodoxy, right? That was the orthodoxy. Right? 14 years ago. What overthrew it was actual discoveries and above all the development of dating techniques, which I repeat are not ideologically convicted. They can go over to the question. Come on, what we have here is a proliferation of ideas, and I'm not arguing with everyone who has these ideas is reactionary, but silly, right? The fact that uh, Shakespeare was probably not very progressive in his view doesn't mean that. Therefore, you mean no better than Shakespeare and Rome? That's an irrelevant argument. No, no. The fact of the matter is, the old gradualist, what he calls the old gradualist thesis, it's not a gradualist thesis at all, but nevertheless, is the explanation is what appears from the current state of scientific knowledge. I repeat, the argument made specifically by these people, I mean, 
Don and that's it, 90 to 100 thousand years ago, somebody else wrote 50,000 and so on. No, the whole mitochondrial DNA thing. It is not compatible with the evidence. Come on, we are the materialists, we've got separate Marxists. A theory has to take into account the actual data. Unless you can show, of course, that the data was all an illusion or a conspiracy, which frankly is absurd. Now then, the question of. Uh, sorry, the sex start, exchange and so on. Now, again, I, would, I have to say it again, because you might get why don't they use this social Nothing whatever can be inferred from a study of animal societies right, to explain human society. Of course we have something in common with chickens and so on, but that's what we need. No question. <laughs> <laughs> What distinguishes human society? And here I come to, there's no other contribution because you ask two specific questions, which I'll try and answer, and make two specific points. What distinguishes us? Distinguishes us from all animals, all other animals on this planet. Okay? It's precisely the tradition, culture, tradition, which arises from production in the broadest sense. You know, Marx said, Man becomes man when he begins to transform the environment, etc., etc., etc. Now, that's the thing. This is how we explain how this happened. Well, we can explain it to a point. Okay. Of course, we don't know about the very remote period. You see, that's why the timing is important. But it's clear on the record that cultural tool using developed and developed in connection with hunting, I repeat, hunting then, long, long ago, and that you can trace the progression through tools and other artifacts and so on and so forth. Uh, incidentally, I don't know, I should throw this in on that. Well, it's only taken minutes. But the last time I heard uh, I was at Larry, I was he was going on about the Neanderthals and how limited their work and so on and so forth. No, really, we you know. We know more about them, actually, how Neanderthal doesn't to belong in the opinion of every constant paleontologist, modern one, not the 40 years ago, 40 years ago there were some human, are classified as Homo sapiens. That is to say, our own species. Two different subspecies. There are four subspecies now. We know, however. At least maybe we can only put you two there, because we actually know something about their ideology. Basically, because they're much more recent, right? <coughs> Ritual burial, which implies an elaborate ideology. Recent. Right? Comparatively recent. But before the origins of culture on this basis, before the origins of culture, I've been told to stop. So, very, very quickly, the second thing uh, from this night, or two other points. <laughs> uh, and the family existed, always existed. Of course not, of course not. Actually, human culture hasn't always existed, right? It evolved in response, that is, family relations evolved in response to the requirements determined in the last resort by the means whereby you earn a living, whereby you subsist, whereby society subsists, and it has had many, many different forms corresponding to changes in the productive process. All this I thought was ABC grown artists. Final point, I have to be final, it's a pity because I don't make a joke. It's got to be a joke. The historic big business, a comrade argued, who is arguing against life, but I think he's entirely wrong to say that the angles argue the historic defeat of female sexual appropriate. You see, you have to bring the actual evidence. That is, of course, about the vast majority of societies that existed 10,000 years ago, we know nothing. But we do know something about the ones who were crucial, the ones that developed in a particular direction, and therefore the consequences of uneven and combined development. And there is not the slightest doubt that these were societies which not only made you meaningful, but based of kinship, the female line, mental illness, and of collective property, collective labour, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's why this exchange argument is an answer. Hunter gatherers do not exchange food for sex or food for food or anything else. 
Well, then he's conventional officer, and this convention has a reason to be socially adapted. It's conducive to the stability of the society and its reproduction. The, the whole notion, you see, you have to import, in order to support the sex drive, a conflict in a free class society without any material basis whatsoever. But somebody else has said, it won't do conflicts. The historic defeat is real. No question whatsoever. Also, editable, but it was real. Might as well, how? Because this is simply relevant. You can say it very simply. Once you have the possibility of creating a surplus, a real surplus, yes? That is to say, grain stored, blocks and herds and so on, you don't have automatically the dissolution of the clan system. On the contrary, it lies for a long, long time. More in some societies than others, we have the possibility. People keep sheep, the sheep are amongst the sheep and goats, amongst the most important of early animals that uh, domesticated in the Middle East, in the Near East, which is the, the crucial thing at that time, that's what determined the subsequent fact all over the world, right? Sheep can be lifted. Yes? It is not necessary to go through the painful business of actually reading it, you know? They can be lifted. Grain stored for next year's harvest can be lifted. You can't lift it in any serious sense from what you can, does it? There's nothing you can take which is of any use to you. Therefore, you have the possibility of war, you have the possibility of conflict, you have the possibility, as King was explained, actually, to lifting cattle, private ownership, or semi private ownership of cattle, including human cattle, because the penny drops. You can't have slavery in a, a, in a hunter gatherer society. Everyone must work and feed everyone, male, female, what have you. There isn't a surplus. There may be a temperance surplus, you know, you kill the belly. Gorge, gorge, gorge. Possibility of a surplus. Once you have a surplus, you have the possibility of the evolution of the disintegration of communal property, the evolution of private property, and subsequently, therefore, the evolution of classes. Now then, this took a long time, so far as we can tell. After all, agriculture dates in the Middle East, the crucial area, for about 10,000 BC, the first clearly documented class societies, 3,000. No doubt there was a, a, a preliminary period, so I've seen a thousand years, you know, of disintegration. Elsewhere in the world that didn't happen at the same time. But once, and this I thought, yeah, I was a child, you know. Someone was asking, talking about, you know, statistics <laughs> and so on. I've read the book, actually. Uh, you see, the problem is this, it's not a big question. Only, some of the last few hundred years, 10,000 years ago, cultivation and domestication of certain animals was developed, right? By that's twelve, what is it, uh, eight thousand BC. By one and a half thousand BC, again, the dating methods, it had gone as far to the west as Britain, as far to the east as Northeast India, Turkestan, and so on and so forth, and by then it incorporated the vast majority of the world's population. Therefore, what happened in that crucial period in the Middle East, the disintegration of the current system, the development of